Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wish to acknowledge the unceded Willistoke territory from which I speak today and the immense privilege I carry as a settler in this land. I would like to begin by extending my deepest condolences and to send strength to all who will be re-traumatized by this new and devastating information regarding the realities of Indian residential schools in Canada. The remains of 215 children have been found buried on the site of a former residential school in Kamloops, BC. Using ground penetrating radar, confirming what families and communities have known but could not substantiate until now. This new knowledge is truth. We need to confront our past and our present with truth before we can even build reconciliation. I remember when I was first introduced to the concept of residential schools. It was during my post-secondary study, studies, largely on my own and in conversations with family and friends. It was not taught to me in school. We only learned that Canada is a land of peacekeepers and apologetic people whose brave pioneer ancestors defied the odds in a barren land to build the country we have today. We have worked very hard to erase the history and culture of Indigenous peoples. We have also worked very hard to erase the people themselves, as well as the evidence of these crimes. Prime Minister Harper's historic apology was largely in response to a mounting potential litigation as rumors and horror stories became all too real with well-documented acts of genocide bubbling to the surface. Yes, genocide. Not simply cultural genocide, preventing language and tradition from flourishing, but the United Nations definition of genocide. From the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, Article 2 of the United Nations, Genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. A, killing members of the group, like throwing a child down a flight of stairs or out a third story window as outlined in Isabel Knockwood's incredible novel, Out of the Depths. B, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, like separating children from their parents and communities, like threatening those who witness abuse with the same fate, like force feeding expired food, shaving sacred hair, and stripping children of their given names and mother tongue, as so many experiences across the country have documented. C, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, like deliberately exposing children to fatal diseases and being proud enough or brazen enough to take photos and share them in textbooks for years to come in celebration of the efforts undertaken to address the Indian problem. The problem, of course, in Canada was their existence. D, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, like forced sterilizations, forced abortions, and infanticide, targeting specific family bloodlines, like those of hereditary chiefs or strong leaders. E, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. And sadly, Madam Speaker, we see this continue today with more Indigenous children in care today than they were enrolled in residential schools at the height of their operation in Canada. There were schools in almost every province and territory in Canada. New Brunswick likes to gloss over this fact, but we too had institutions where children were treated like animals or worse, and parents were stripped of their rights right here in our backyard, simply be before Confederation, so Canada washed its hands of accountability. In doing my own research, I studied survivor testimonials, historic news articles, and official records. It took me two years to pour through the information. I wept, I was angry, ridden with guilt, frustration. I particularly remember watching the film We Were Children with my high school students as their cultural teacher. I was six months pregnant with my second child, an indigenous child who would be born with the same beautiful brown skin that his father has. I could not contain my emotion as I can't right now. My baby seemed more and more like a miracle the descendant of survivors, excuse me. My sons have never met their great grandparents. They died too young. We call them survivors because they came from Shubenegadi alive when so many did not. However, the nightmare of their experiences would follow them, would continue to eat away at their soul, would be present in their parenting style, in their substance abuse, in their domestic violence, in their internalized racism, in their pain. The discovery of the remains of 215 innocent children is beyond devastating. Canada, apologies, payouts, even days of recognition will never be enough. 215 families were given no answers about their babies, some as young as three years old, the same age as my youngest child. When we have senators, leaders of political parties, and everyday Canadians suggesting that these schools had good intentions, weren't all bad, 
or we're a product of the times. I say, how dare you? Systemic murder, often in front of other children, followed with threats and intimidation, and a disgusting cover-up with the use of mass graves, forged records, and death certificates. This is not an isolated incident for this school. One child's death and erasure are criminal, despicable. 215, with the potential of more grave sites across Canada to be found now more likely than ever, is genocide. We are so quick to step on our pedestal and wave our fingers at other countries for their transgressions when our stool may well sit on the graves of Indigenous children killed by church and state right here in Canada. Shame. Shame. There is no apology in the world that will take this pain away. There has been a lot of talk of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples in Canada, but truth must come first. And the truth is that most Canadians have no idea of the full impact of residential schools, the residual effects, and the intergenerational trauma. Bill C-5 is a necessary step to fulfill a recommendation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and to bring much needed awareness to the horrors of the past, as well as those that continue. Make no mistake, missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit peoples is part of this legacy. Joyce Etchikan's death is part of this legacy. Chantal Moore's death is part of this legacy. A National Day of Reconciliation is only as good as the space it creates for truth. Truth about what has been and truth about what is. I fully support Bill C-5 and I stand with my colleagues in this house today to see that it becomes law. It is long overdue. It is reactive rather than proactive, however. For those children and their families, please, we must do better. Thank you. Questions and comments? Questions et commentaires? The Honourable Member, uh, the Honourable Non-Honourable Deputy de Berthier-Masquinonger. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Je remercie beaucoup euh, notre collègue du Parti vert de son discours euh, touchant et émotif. Euh, nous partageons, euh, nous partageons, nous portons une partie de ses émotions aujourd'hui. Je ne sais pas si ça a pu la, la réconforter. Euh, J'aimerais qu'elle nous parle, je vais, je vais répondre à la question que j'ai posée tantôt, j'aimerais qu'elle nous parle de la voie à suivre pour l'avenir. Bien sûr, l'adoption de cette, de cette euh, journée-là, je pense que ça fait unanimité à la Chambre, mais ensuite, euh, pour améliorer le partenariat, la fameuse réconciliation pour qu'elle ait lieu pour vrai, il ne faut pas arriver euh, avec les communautés autochtones et vouloir encore faire preuve de paternalisme. Il faut qu'il leur donne les moyens qu'elles se, qu se gèrent eux-mêmes et qu'ils prennent eux-mêmes leurs décisions et qu'on puisse vivre dans un véritable partenariat. J'aimerais l'entendre sur la suite des choses. Merci. The Honourable Member for Fredericton. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I, I thank my honourable colleague for that question. And, and absolutely, the, the legacy of paternalism continues. Um, you know, I, I very boldly voted against Bill C-15, and I know it came as a shock for a lot of people, but it was, it was a protest. It was because we still have the Indian Act in Canada. Those parents of those children were unable to seek legal counsel because it was illegal in our country to do so. So we have not done the work of reconciliation and, and to pass a bill to say that it may, it may happen you know, with a stroke of a pen is, is irresponsible and it continues that paternalistic approach. Indigenous communities have the, the capacity, they have the leadership to determine their own fates. They must be given the resources that they need to do that. Uh, and that is the way forward. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Battle River Crowfoot. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I'd, and I'd like to thank the member for her speech. And I know uh, I, I, I work for the government of Saskatchewan when they dedicated um, a, a Indian industrial school um, uh, a cemetery to be a provincial, the provincial historic site, and how powerful that ceremony was, and 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 the memory of those those lives that that were lost in unmarked graves. There, it is it is a tragic part of our of our history. So I thank the member for for bringing this forward, and I and I'm glad to see that we can 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 see the that this has passed. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to to make more of a comment than a question, but thank the member for her speech. I remember for Fredericton. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I, I thank very much my colleague for those kind words. Um, I, I mentioned my role as a teacher, and um, I worked at a middle school here in the city of Fredericton, where outside is a, is a very famous large cemetery. Um, you know, it's, it's from members of the community from, from days gone by, but the children often make comments about looking outside and how sad it is to see a cemetery, um, you know, rather than, say, a, a playground or something more uplifting. And the truth is, for so many children in residential schools, that was, that was the reality. You know, every school had a graveyard. Um, that reality alone should shock us all into action. 
The action is the key. So we can be as upset as we want. Um, we can be as moved as we want, but unless those actions follow, uh, we, we are still failing. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's the Honourable Member for Vancouver East. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And I just want to say thank you so much to the members. Um, very thoughtful and heartfelt uh, speech. Um, just exactly to the point around action. Uh, what we know is that uh, there is such delay in implementing the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls cause for action. Uh, the government promised that, in fact, they would deliver on that last year, and still we, we, we were nowhere near. I wonder if the member could comment on that. Uh, the pandemic, should the pandemic be an excuse to say that that's why there is a delay, or is it the opposite, because the pandemic, that we need to actually step up on the action? Our member for Fredericton. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank so much, my honourable colleague, for that question. And in your rights, there, there's there's no justification for inaction uh, on 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 the missing and murdered Indigenous women's uh, file. Um, you know. And if anything, the pandemic exacerbated issues specifically for women um, or for vulnerable communities. And and to see that we're potentially using that as an excuse is is it's it's beyond upsetting. Um, and and you know we also failed to to follow through with the recommendations from the Royal Commission. We followed to fail, follow through with the recommendations from the TRC. We've we've ticked off a couple, but we're nowhere near what we need to achieve. So it's just I'm so frustrated. Um, and again, I I have to just mention C15, and that's really. I hope people can understand what I was trying to do with that. And it's to educate. We're not there yet. We have to continue these really difficult conversations. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'll allow for a brief question. The Honourable Member for Sandwich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to my dear friend and colleague from Fredericton for a very important speech. My, I noted, I noted her reference to Chantelle Moore. And I want to ask her, Chantelle Moore, being a young woman from Vancouver Island, from New Chalmers Territory, who was killed in the area where the Honourable Member for Fredericton lives and works, is there any update? Has her family been given any information about how she was murdered in the course of a wellness check? A brief uh, answer from the Member for Fredericton. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank my Honourable colleague for bringing up this issue. I have to say her name as many times as I can. Chantal Moore, her family, they deserve answers, they deserve justice, and our province can no longer sit on that report. It has been completed for some time now, and they need to see every cross T and dotted I of what went into what happened that night. And we need to look across Canada about what wellness checks bring on, what kind of threats it brings to people of color, to Indigenous people across this country. We continue to fail. Thank you, Madam Speaker.